Good morning, Roxbury Church. Thank you so much for joining us this morning from the comfort of your homes and off of your couches. I hope you are well rested and caffeinated and ready to praise Jesus this morning. Tears. 
Guys, thank you for being with us today. Um, please continue to worship with us and, and surrender to our Lord Jesus because we love him. Yeah. 
guys. Please continue to worship with us. The sparrows now worry about tomorrow, all the troubles to come. The lilies now thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. A tree that's planted by the water isn't faced by You take good care of me. You take good care of me. And you know what I need before I even ask the thing. You hold me in your hands with the kindness that never ends. And carry in your love no matter what the future brings. You take good care.
Hey, Rock Spring, how you doing? Let me just let you know that here for the second week in a row, we've um, canceled our in-person services, and so we're here on a Saturday night uh, pre-snow and uh, recording this so we can be with you tomorrow morning, and um, hope you guys are all going to be home safe um, in your PJs, um, having church, maybe drinking some coffee, and um, we're going to be starting a new series today. But before we jump into that, just let me share this with you. Today, today we're beginning at our 1030 service, our interactive platform. So we have some hosts there. You can watch the service, just enjoy it, sit back. You don't have to interact. But there's going to be some features in this new platform, and they're going to show you the link that you can go to. If you want to interact, um, you got to go to this link at 1030, and uh, you'll be able to be prayed for. You can ask questions. Um, you can interact with the hosts and chat with one another. It's just going to be a fantastic thing we're going to be adding to our uh, what's available here at Rock Spring. Uh, but this service today, uh, this new series we're beginning is called First Responders. Now, you may think when you hear that term that we're um, talking about what we typically think of with a first responder. There's emergency personnel that go out. Some of them will probably be out today. I hope not. Um, taking care of our needs. And I just want to say before we begin, we appreciate those first responders, um, those emergency personnel, EMTs, um, the record crews that go out and rescue us, and the police officers that are there. We, rec we really, really appreciate those first responders. But this series today is not about them. Uh, this series is actually about relationship. And I was li listening to the worship set as these guys came in, and, and they have a relationship. Our worship team has a relationship, and they were talking with one another uh, before uh, we started recording tonight. And relationships are everything, and that's what this series is about. And I was listening to those songs that they were doing, and the first song had a line in it that said, It's my joy to lose my life. My joy to lose my life. I will love you with my yes. And the second song went on to say, I surrender, I surrender. How do we do that? Because the last song talked about the way God takes good care of us. And I just want to share with you that those first two songs, it's amazing, hadn't even thought about it until I was listening to the worship team sing those songs. It's almost a prerequisite, those first two songs, those first two songs, I will lose my life to you, for you. I just surrender. Because here's the thing. If we want God to take good care of us, we have to do those two things. We have to surrender, and we have to lay down our lives in order for him to do everything he wants us to do. But how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, I believe the biggest, single, most important way we can do that is in our relationships. It's in our relationships. Relationships are everything. And the reason that we call it first responders is, you may probably don't think about this, but in every single relationship you have, whether it's with a spouse or your children or your coworkers, maybe an ex, all of those relationships, the ones that you want to have in your life, and the ones that life just hands you, all of those relationships, in every single one of them, you're a first responder. You respond to each and every person in your life. Some of these relationships come with challenges, and how we choose to respond in them are going to mean everything. If we aren't intentional about how we respond, when it comes to our relationships, we can respond by either our feelings or by playing Mr. Fix-It. I know us guys, we, we, we struggle with this a lot. We, we, we have people come to us, our wives, our kids, and, and they, and they want to share their feelings with us about a problem, and, and we just want to jump in and fix it. But, but here's, the, here's the thing. If we're not intentional about the way we respond, we can develop the habit of responding either by our feelings 
or by wanting to fix it. And this, this, this can be a problem because when we respond with our feelings... Have your feelings ever come back to bite you? Have you ever responded? Was your first response out of anger or irritation? And then you discovered that while it felt good maybe to release that emotion, the fallout from it caused feelings of pain? Regret, remorse? Or, or have you ever tried to play fix it in your relationship? Um, I know there's times that I have said when I shouldn't say these things that, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Or, just get over it. See, sometimes when we try to fix problems, we don't really try to fix the problem. We try to fix the person with the problem. And there's a lot of emotional risk to even come and share with you or with someone else that they're even having a problem. We've got to realize and become intentional about our responses and realize that if we're not intentional about our responses, we can actually become a habit in how we respond. It's not easy for me to, to share some of the things that, that go on in my life, but it really is important to me that you realize that I'm not just a pastor or a preacher telling you what you should do, and I've got it all down, um, I've got it fixed, I don't have issues in my life. And this, this, Just let me share with you, that I'm still dealing with this. I, I think sometimes the reason God has me talk to you about these things is because he realizes that, that I'm still dealing with them my, myself. I've, I've created a habit of responding to my wife as much as I love her. The way my mind works, my thought process, when I'm, when I'm interacting with somebody in a text or a, a message or I'm preparing um, a talk with you guys, my mind has a, I just have a one-track mind, and something will come up, and she'll come in to me and want to discuss something with her, and it interrupts my train of thought. And, and here's the thing, for me, maybe not, you don't struggle with this one, but I'm hoping you can relate. When, I, when, I, when that train of thought is broken, it, it's almost impossible for me to get it back. And so I have developed a habit of letting her know that I'm not real happy about her interrupting that train of thought. It's not that I want to make her feel bad or I'm trying to make her feel bad. It's just the difficulty of getting those thoughts back and getting back on track is so hard. It's easier, I feel, to let her know that she has interrupted me than it is to think about how letting her know, and we all have ways. I mean, we don't even have to use our words. You realize that? We can, just the way we look, or maybe sometimes it's what we don't say. But we all have a way of letting them know. And it serves a purpose, our purpose. But when it comes to relationships, sometimes Serving our purpose really isn't serving our best interest. I mean, when it comes right down to it with you and with me and that illustration I just used, what's, what's more important? How I feel, the difficulty in getting my thought processes back on track, or bettering the relationship that I believe is the most important in my life, second only to my relationship with my Heavenly Father. And, and here's the thing. When I talk about surrendering or losing my life so that God can make my life better, here's, here's what my Father, my Heavenly Father says to me. Love 
your wife as Christ loves the church. In other words, God wants me to lose myself to myself and to love her. And the benefit from that will be the way he cares for me and my relationship with him. Jesus tells us that our Heavenly Father has a plan to protect our relationships. And when we listen to Him and we protect those relationships, it betters our relationship with Him. Jesus says this in Matthew 22, verse 39. He says the most important thing we can do is to love someone as much as we love ourselves. This is why developing a habit and responding to people out of habit is not really the best method we want to adopt. We want to be intentional about it. We want to think. See, if, if I was doing it God's way, if I was losing my life and, and surrendering to God, when, when I'm busy taking care of you or preparing a message or interacting with somebody who has a spiritual question or a problem, and Kathy, my wife, comes to me and, 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 and needs to interrupt that time, the, the, the way Jesus wants me to deal with this, and I wish I could get it, I wish I could get this, I understand it, but I need to break that old habit, is to consider how I would feel if I were in her place needing my attention when I'm feeling like I don't want to break my train of thought. I need to love her as I love myself. How are you doing with that in your relationships? The Apostle Paul reminded the, the church, the early church, when he wrote, the group of people at a town called Corinth. In his first letter to them, he wrote to remind them the very thing that Jesus said about loving others the same way we love ourselves. He said it like this. Look at it in 1 Corinthians uh, verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 14. He says, do everything in love. Everything. Do everything. In other words, love should be our motivation in how we respond. It should be our first response in everything that we do. Honestly, unless we learn to move away from our feelings and consider how our response will affect others, we're likely going to be stuck in a cycle of, of responding out of feelings or trying to fix things. And while it feels good, maybe, to respond in irritation or anger or whatever other mode we, we choose to respond in, make that our first response, we then end up dealing with the fallout. I don't know about you, I don't like dealing with the fallout from damaged relationships. And what Jesus wants us to understand and what the Apostle Paul was reminding the church was our first response should always be love. Let me ask you this. Do you react or do you respond? There's a dynamic that happens a lot of times in, in marriage relationships, and I don't want to stereotype anything, but, but usually women come from what we consider a more feelings-based approach to life, and, and men of more practical, although practical is probably not a good word, we just want to attack things and fix it. And the problem is, if, if we respond from our feelings, there's fallout from that, but then if we don't consider someone else's feelings and we take what they're coming to talk with us about as just a task to get done, we can end up 
while we're not responding from our feelings, we're fixing a problem. But what if when your daughters or your wife or another friend comes and wants to just tell you how they're feeling and you immediately respond by trying to fix a problem, you don't realize they don't really even want it fixed. They just want you to love them by letting them share with how they're feeling about a particular problem in their life. I know this has been a struggle for me my entire life. I want to fix it. When our volunteer staff or staff come here with a, with a problem, I immediately go into, I have a habit of going into the mode of, of trying to fix the problem. I, I'm so bad at it that I even try to anticipate the problems. And so I'll go to other leaders or other friends, uh, workers, and, and, and tell them that if they don't do something, it's going to cause a problem. And then when they don't listen to that advice and the problem happens, I respond with my feelings. See, all of these things make our relationships a landmine. And God wants you to know that when you don't consider intentionally how you're going to respond first, you're going to have a hard time navigating life. And God wants to protect you. He doesn't want to make your life harder. He wants to make your life more fruitful, more joyful. See, when we try to fix things, well, let me just ask you some questions about that, that thought of, approaching our first response with people in our lives as fixing it. What if, what if they aren't the problem? I mean, we try to fix them by telling them things, as I just said a few moments ago, well, Kathy will share with me how she's feeling. Well, honey, you, you shouldn't feel that way. You shouldn't let it bother you. <laughs> I mean, I know that she doesn't want to hear that even when the words are leaving my mouth, but what if I'm trying to fix her? What if I'm in an attempt to fix the problem, I'm really trying to fix her, but what if she's not the problem? What if, what if when we say those things, we're really spinning our wheels because they're not the problem? Or, or what if they just wanted to share? I mean, what if? Or what if when you're attempting to fix the problem, the problem that needs to be fixed is really you or me. See, being first responders in relationship is extremely important because whether our response is based on our, our feelings, we just get irritated and respond that way, or we get angry, um, or we see the problem and we forget the relationship and we just want to go fix it, whether we're a fix it or a feelings-based responder, God wants loving others to always be our first response. Now, let me begin to wrap up. I mean, I know it's going to be morning when you see this, but this, this evening for me, let me just wrap up or begin to wrap up with some, some thoughts and some advice. Because... I don't want to be one of those people that irritate me. I don't want to just identify a problem. I don't want to just, I don't want you to just hear me saying today that maybe your problem is life is that you're responding by your feelings, or maybe the difficulty you're having in life is you're trying to fix something nobody even wants fixed. I don't want to just identify. Anybody can identify problems. But God doesn't want to just be an identifier of problems. He wants to help us resolve the challenges and the difficulties in our life. So let me just wrap up the first installment of this series, because we're going to be looking at it over the next three or four weeks. 
how our responses impact our lives. And, and let me do that by sharing some advice from the Bible. Because remember, it's God that wants to protect us. It's God that wants us to learn to be intentional about our first responses so that we know how to actually go about daily learning to lose ourselves. Learning to turn our challenges into joy. And the Apostle James, when, when he wrote his letter to the church, because they're having an awful lot of relational difficulties, and he says this to them in, in, in the first chapter, verse 19 of that letter. He said, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Here's my advice. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I, I don't know about you. I'm just going to tell you, I, I suck at this. I know this verse, I remember it, I try to apply it in my life, but I really want to get serious in my own life, because I, ha I have a hit or miss approach to things. I know what God wants me to do, and I have a, a habit of getting into doing it for a while, and the benefits become amazing. But for some reason, and maybe you struggle with this too, I, I gravitate back to the old way of living. Th this is what was happening with, with some of the people that, that James was writing to. And he wanted them to understand that, that in order to turn things around, we, we have to be quick to listen. Often... Our first response, if we're honest, is to prepare a response when we should be listening. I, I want to challenge you this week to be quick to listen because we're going to put this cell up here for you to see, but I want you to think about it as you read it. When in your relationships this week, be it your spouse or your kids or a coworker, um, maybe somebody you just happened to meet who, who wants to share something with you. Are you really listening? Because I've, I've had to come to terms that a lot of times when someone is speaking to me, I'm not really listening. I, I may hear the first few words that they put out, and then I immediately go into response mode. I'm beginning to formulate the next thing I'm going to say before they've even finished their thought. <laughs> Can I share with you my first rule of wisdom? That this isn't from the Bible. This isn't Solomon, who was the wisest man to ever live. This is, this is wisdom from Pastor Mike. Don't believe everything you think. Sometimes it's more important just to hear what those that are in our lives to have a relationship with, sometimes it's just more important to hear what they're saying than to actually even have a response. Maybe sometimes it's more important just to hear what they have to say to us than it is to ever even give a response. Yet again, I've found myself often listening to the first few words and immediately go into response mode. And for me, quite often, it's because my nature is to fix it. See, my heart is right. I want to help. But what if they really aren't looking for a solution? What if they're looking for a relationship? What if the thing that needs to be fixed most 
is me. It, it makes the words that I'm going to say, what I'm thinking about when I should be listening, really not that important at all, which I believe is the reason the second bit of advice James gave to us was this, be slow to speak. I really struggle with this. How are you just being quiet with someone? Don't you hate it when you're out with somebody that you're in relationship with and you can never get a word in edgewise? You just sit there and listen or pretend to listen. You're formulating things to say, but they never really let you say them. And it's, it's because they don't realize, we don't realize how damaging it is to be so quick to speak. The apostle James wants us to understand that we need to think, we need to stop, slow down, and think about the effect our words are even going to have. Words are like a rocket. Once they're launched, they can't be recalled. But they can really blow up, can't they? How many times have you said something because you immediately thought it was the right thing to say, it's a good thing to say, or I feel like this is what I need to say, and you push the launch button and you spend the rest of the day, maybe even a week, or possibly sometimes even a lifetime, dealing with the fallout for being so quick with the words. What if we could prevent the fallout in the first place? I believe James wanted us to understand that if we would just take a breath, take a moment. We live in a society and in a world where everything is so fast-paced. We can't deal without our phones. We can't deal without looking at the last comment. Or I believe the greatest value we could ever add to our life is just learning to slow down and rest and be intentional. But you know what it's going to take to be able to do that for you or for me? We're going to have to lose ourselves. We're going to have to surrender to what our Heavenly Father wants us to do in the relationships that He's given us. Again, both the ones we choose to have and the ones that life brings us. Because you know what? There's nothing that ever happens in your life or my life in our relationships that God doesn't already know or have a plan to use. And he does take good care of us if we let him. So much of our time when we're using our words and we're quick to speak instead of slowing down, it's because our society, even our relationships, tell us that being number one, being right, is the most important thing. But Jesus says, no, being right, being number one, that's not the most important thing. Actually, being number two, loving someone else is. So, and, and think about this. Being number one without a relationship doesn't really count for very much. Anyway, just this afternoon, here I am talking to you and sharing with you what God wants us to do and the way he wants us to live, but I got it wrong this afternoon. 
with the woman I love the most in my life. I can be right, but if I don't have her, <laughs> what good is being right? That's why James says, be slow to speak. And then he gives us one more. He says, be slow to become angry. I believe he shares this because he wants us to understand our anger is the exact opposite of loving others because our anger, if we really are honest with ourselves, come from our selfish motives. It's a selfish focus. It, it, it's a motive from the heart of how we feel, be it inconvenience or hurt or wrong or irritation from being interrupted because, oh my God, I'll never be able to get these thoughts back. And, and it's interesting because we translate the Greek word that was being used by James as anger, and, and the Greek word is orge, but it it's not the type of anger that you and I actually think of. It's not an outburst. It's not just going off the deep end. It's, it's really a state of being. Be slow to adopt a state of being that's founded in anger or irritation or being defensive or argumentative. I mean, what the Apostle Paul, our Apostle James wants us to understand is if, if we find our, our responses being motivated from our inner being, because our inner being, our inner self is just at unrest or irritated or frustrated. If that's our inner state of being, we're not going to be slow in our emotional responses. Our emotional responses, our responses are, are going to be motivated by emotion. Because it's about how we feel. It's not about loving someone else. Not about how our response is going to make them feel. But, but here's the thing. We can almost be selfish about this. In other words, if, if I were to really begin to apply this, and I am trying to apply this, I'm, I'm, I'm really learning that I have some habits I've got to turn around and I, I've got to break. And if I do that, while it's going to benefit those that I'm in a relationship with, you know who's going to benefit the most? Myself. So let me just ask you this. Is your first response your best response? Is it really what's going to benefit those you're in relationship with, and you, the best? Because your best response will always be motivated by love, but, but not the kind of love we think of. We, we, boy, we, we take that word and we just, we, we mess it up. Our society ha doesn't even begin to understand what true love is, what, what God talks about, because it's not a feelings-based love. It, it's not a, a love an emotional love first. And it's not, even, it's not even a love toward people first. It, it's a love toward God because Jesus told us this. He said, the greatest thing we can do, the greatest way we can live is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and with all our strength. Not an emotion. God can't command you 
to have a feeling toward him. He can't tell you that, that you have to conjure up this emotion, but he can tell you this. He can tell you that your actions express an intentional love. And when you choose to love him by laying down yourself, losing yourself, taking up, Jesus said, as your cross daily, and you do this, you do this for him, but you do it through others, which is why Jesus said the second greatest commandment is this, to love others as you love yourself. That's God's plan. And, and when we do it, we do it, it benefits us. The Apostle James said this. He said, if you come close to God, God will come close to you. How do we do that? It's a logical question. If you're thinking that, if you want to ask that question, or if you're on our interactive platform and you want to just type it out, man, go ahead and do that. But I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the answer here. How do you do that? By choosing God's ways. How do you move close to God? By choosing his ways. What I mean is this. James said choosing God means considering the challenges that we have in life as an opportunity for joy. He said it this way. Consider it pure joy when you face challenges of many kinds. Most of the challenges we'll face are relational based. And I choose God's ways by loving Him through loving others. In other words, if I can break the habit, habit of responding to the person in this life I love the most, when she comes and asks me a question, instead of feeling like she's interrupting me, if I can lose myself by killing that habit, it'll protect and better my relationship with her, but it also moves me toward God. And when we move toward God, we find joy. Let me give you one final example from my own life. And I've shared this with you guys many, many times. But, but again, I feel like I really want you to, to, to understand what I'm talking about tonight. And, and, and I'm one of those. When it comes to being on the road, one of, I'm one of those drivers. You know what I'm talking about? I, I get in my car for one purpose, and it's not to relax. It's to get to, from point A to point B and to get there as fast as I possibly can. But there's some of those other drivers. I got a cartoon on, that I keep on my phone, and it's actually a picture of the stereotypical devil, and he's pushing some people into a, a room with fire. And the caption underneath is, I always knew there was a special place there for those kind of drivers to get in my way. Now, about eight months ago or nine months ago, I was doing a talk, didn't even realize that a young lady here in church uh, was listening to me until she wrote me a week later, and I was sharing this concept about surrendering myself to God on the road, that when somebody gets in the fast lane for no reason other than to slow me down, it's, it's an opportunity See, this is what James was talking about. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many time. Consider it pure joy. Why? Because it's an opportunity. And at, back at that time when I was hitting on all eight cylinders, I would get behind someone and I was trying to break my old habit of, of just getting irritated and impatient, raising my blood pressure and dealing with all these things. And, and I began to surrender myself to God by praying for them. I saw it as an opportunity. Every time someone did something I didn't like on the road, instead of allowing myself to be motivated by my feelings or wanting to fix it by pulling around them, you know, and showing them just how irritated I was. Come on, I know somebody out there 
does these same things. When I choose to see it as an opportunity to lose myself and pray for them, I was experiencing joy. But I let myself, as I have a habit of doing, fall back in to my old habits and ways. And it wasn't long after that that I was losing my joy of driving again. See, I'm on the road to get it back. This series is not for you alone. It's probably more for me than it is for any of you. So here's what I want you to do this week. If anything that I've said to you tonight hits a chord in your relationships, when the challenges come, see it as an opportunity. See it as an opportunity, as James said, to move closer to God. And by doing so, finding the joy that Jesus promised us we could have. He said, in this life you'll have trouble. And I've come that you may have joy. See it as an opportunity. But don't just see the opportunity. Seize the opportunity. Seeing it isn't enough. Knowing it isn't enough. That's the problem I have. I know all of this stuff. I need to seize it. And when I draw closer to God, He promises to draw closer to me. Here's the good news for you tonight. That same promise has been given to you. Feel free to reach out to me. You know what, part of going through life together, what makes going through life together even better is, is, is sharing our challenges, encouraging one another. Last week I got two or three encouraging letters from, from people. You know, knowing that we help one another and knowing how to help one another is one of the greatest assets we can have. But it takes being intentional. You are a first responder in every relationship you have. And you have been given the ability to be moving closer to God and to have the only one who can really take care of you. Take care of you. Seize the opportunity. Hope you guys enjoy tomorrow. Stay safe. Stay warm. Watch the Super Bowl. Don't let it raise your blood pressure. Yeah, that's a good one. We'll see you next week.